quantum science of psychedelics. Chapter 11. Oh, a look at psychedelics through modern science. From shamanism to psychedelics. For an inquisitive mind, such experiences with plant medicine naturally raise the question of where these visions in the ayahuasca world come from and why the psychedelic brew has the kind of effects that it does. It seems to alter your state of consciousness by breaking down the veils that exist between our everyday experiences of life and the spirit world. Regardless of how it is produced, these altered states create a space where there is a presence of something higher and more mysterious than what we normally perceive. And in this space, the shaman undergoes a journey where unexpected and sometimes bizarre events take place. After our visit to shamanic state in the previous chapter, I will now put on my lab coat and focus exclusively on psychedelic agents and here summarize some of what modern science knows about them. This includes the considerable evidence that has been collected in the recent decades showing that if psychedelics are given in the right setting, they may indeed be healing. It is then natural to ask why this is the case, and to answer this, we will approach the question of how psychedelics and plant medicine work, including how the transition to an altered state of consciousness can be triggered by a chemical substance. Yet, as should be clear by now, the answer to this will to a large extent depend on your understanding of how the universe works and what the origin of the multidimensionality may be. I have argued that quantum theory is crucial for understanding how psychedelics generate the experiences people have with them, what is often referred to as their phenomenology. Hey, come sit down. You're okay, lie down. No, you've been to the park, you play. You got your hour or two. <clears throat> To address these questions, I will explore the nature of psychedelics in this chapter and the next. In the present chapter, I will provide some basic information from established science, and in chapter 12, we will see how we more deeply can understand, with the help of macrocosmic quantum theory, how psychedelics work and why they may be healing. This discussion will include not only some specialized information about the biochemical and pharmacological interactions these substances are involved in, but also the equally important in chapter 12, the wider context in which these take place. Hence, there is much more to understanding the working of psychedelics than can be given by an example of biochemical or neurological mechanism. And this is why this book has to, had to present such extensive preparatory material before addressing its central topic. Honestly, I am so interested in all of this previous preparatory material, I feel like I could read a novel on every single one of them. <clears throat> To fully explain how psychedelics work and to understand why they may alter our state of consciousness, we need to establish and understand the relationships among several different layers, such as the chemical structures of psychedelic substances, their pharmacological and biological biochemical activities, the effects of these on the brain as an enti entity, the pharmacological, the phenomenological, the phenomenon, the phenomenon, phenomenology, the phenomenology. Yeah, this, is, this says phenomenology. The phenomenology, I caught a typo, aha! The phenomenology of their effects or how they alter our experience of reality and at last, how this phenomenology is related to the cosmos at large. None of the relationships between these levels can be ignored if we want to arrive at a complete scientific understanding. To establish such relationships is more difficult for psychedelics than for most other drugs, partly because of the versatility and broad range of their effects, from changes in perception to interactions with spirit entities. Since these experiences may vary among individuals, and also from experience to the next, the challenge of providing a coherent explanation for their phenomenology becomes even greater. In studies of the effects of psychedelics, it is, in other words, necessary to look at the reproductibility in a different way than usual in a scientific investigation. Complicating their study further are the present reports of Spiritual experiences under their influences, something modern science has no place for because of the versatility as well as the underlying philosophical differences in the approaches to understanding them. It is not surprising that even the term of these mind-altering substances has caused much debate. Do you know, when you, uh, when you experience a meditative state and you're really open and in tune, whether you achieve that through ecstatic dance or ecstatic breathing or psychedelic substances, if they hook an EKG up to your brain to see your brain activity, as far as the electrical activity, it actually reads an all-time low, like you are having no thoughts at all in the standard EKG format. 
um, which is fascinating because it, it, it sort of proves his re reductive valve theory in terms of when you're moving up the chain of consciousness and experiencing more of that spirit world or the heart of the sky, um, your brain activity in terms of ego itself and that central driver is actually much, much less. The electrical activity is lower. But then why do people having these experiences report all time high in, in experience? It's because they're actually leaving your brain a little bit. Your, your consciousness is actually arriving to you at a higher plane than it normally arrives inside the form of self and entirely filtered through the mechanism of the mind. Um, I guess that's what shamanism is. He said that that's the state. So it's interesting that in modern science, um, the electrical activity of the mind actually appears to be almost null when you're experiencing psychedelics or a shamanistic state, even though the experiencer uh, goes on full and amazing journeys. Hey, stop crying. She can't go outside in the backyard on her own anymore because she's a little too destructive. You have had, you've been to the dog park for an hour, it took you for an hour's run and walk through the woods. You have food, you have water, you have love. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> you just settle. The terminology and chemical structures of psychedelics. The most widely used terms for substances, including effects similar to the shamanistic state, clearly is psychedelics. Although a, world, a whole range of other terms has also been suggested. The word psychedelic certainly has drawbacks. For instance, it is in some parts of society stigmatized by their use in the 1960s when such substances were rarely looked on as sacraments. A further problem I have with the term psychedelics is that at the etymology, it means mind or psyche enhancing. As I have already suggested, I do not consider these substances to be mind enhancing, but instead be mind dis disengaging, yes, or mind decoupling, yes. And it is this very aspect of them that enables people to have spiritual experiences. On the other hand, if psychedelics is taken to mean enhancing psychic content, I am, on a broad, I am on broad with the term as long as psyche is not used in a strictly individual sense, but as something much broader generated by cosmic creation waves. I want to add too, this book is so important to me. So if you're... If, like this book and reading this and the sharing of it, yes, it absolutely is for people who are... Uh, spiritually inclined to open it, to go on those experiences. It is absolutely for people who are just curious about a quantized universe. But also for me, this is so impactful because synesthesia and the way my brain works, um, and for the neuroatypical crowd, if you're like me, this is useful because my brain is pretty much giving me a psychedelic-like experience all the time without requiring any substances, necessarily any ecstatic dance, or shamanic breathing. It just happens for me. So if you're neuroatypical and your mind is always decoupling, as, 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 our, as our author would put it, um, this book is for you. I think that this is teaching me tools. It's helping me understand the science of the universe, which is helping me understand myself, which is helping me how to understand how to monitor and find a healthy directionality in my mind. Because if you can dismantle all of your delusions around what you think and make your story not even personal to yourself, then it can just be about the layers of truth and the science and how the world works. And maybe then, maybe then some of the synesthesia and how my mind experiences dream space, um, maybe it'll be useful to me. Maybe if I can work on my ego that much and arm myself with enough tools which which this author is giving me a lot of tools, more than, more than a lecture and like, a, here's how it all works. And he's not doing that. He's giving me tools to investigate self. So if you're neuroatypical and you find yourself in a lot of existential situations and the world's a really scary, hard place for you, at least society, and this book's for you. This, this is a self-help book for the neuroatypical. <clears throat> A further problem I have with the term psychedelics is, yeah, I do not consider these substances to be mind enhancing. Yeah, if psychedelics is taken to mean enhancing psychic content, I'm on board with this term as long as psyche, as long as psyche is not used in a strictly individual sense, but as something much broader generated by cosmic waves. 
Some also avoid the term psychedelic because they associate it with artificial human-made chemicals in contrast to substances originating from plants and mushrooms, and so prefer the term plant medicine. Being a chemist, I find it hard to accept that the same substance in a plant is different from when the humans made it. I, I'm on board with that. This is all minerals, metals, and elements. It's just a bunch of photons fooling around in different arrangements to create this big, beautiful, interactive, physical hologram. So yes, I'm, I'm on board with him. Besides, not all plant medicines are psychedelic, so plant medicine does not seem like a proper, like a perfect term to use either. The term ethnogen means a substance, chemical, plant, or mushroom that generates divinity from within has become commonplace and has a more spiritual ring to it. Mmm, ethnogens. <laughs> However, this term is not fully consistent with my view either, as it may imply that something is only happening inside the human being and his or her brain which is quite opposite to the message of the book here. What I love so much about actual scientists and chemists and mathematicians relative to someone like me who kind of regurgitates what they've said in, in metaphors that are like user-friendly. That's what I do. I, I create metaphors out of this madness to create so that you know other people can understand. Um, but what I love about him is that like, man, he's a chemist. He has a methodical mind for truth and clarity. So he doesn't just stop at a term. Instead, he's like, no, that's not quite right. It's close, but it's not it. And he just goes, he just keeps looking. And I really admire that. I want to be the person that keeps looking and looking and looking um, in the places that I'm drawn to quest. Since psychedelic substances seem to have a potential of opening up a channel to the heart of the sky and is located outside of us, the activation of divinity within does not, in my view, provide an adequate picture. The term hallucinogen may sometimes be useful, but it has a negative connotation as it implies that the experiences are unreal illusions of the brain, which makes it, its use questionable. So despite its shortcomings, I prefer the use of the term psychedelics, although sometimes interchangeably with other terms. The reader at least now knows what kind of problems I have with using any of these terms. If it were up to me, brain decompartmentalizers, quantum state alternators, or a term for opening a channel to the divide, such as coxin summics would be the most appropriate. Cool. Regardless, the focus of the following will not be so much on the psychedelic chemicals as such, but rather on why they give rise to the experiences they do, which after all is what is important from the perspective of the potential for healing. The chemical structures of the most well-known classic psychedelics together with the neurotransmitter serotonin represented in figure 11.1 on page 212 they are classic psychedelics, all have an NND alkali ethylene group attached to an Odling ring and belong to the tryptamine family as psychoactive substances. The reason that serotonin is included among them here is that they all share a structural similarity with the neurotransmitters, which is the basis for their binding to the receptors. Not included in the figure are a host of other substances in this family that are structurally related to have similar effects but not being as widely used either in shamanic traditions or as psychedelic substances in modern times. There are also other substances with similar effects to tryptamines, such as phenylalkamines, including mesocline mes mes from peyote, which presumably have a similar mode of activation. But for the sake of simplicity, I will either leave these outside of the following discussions. Let's give you guys a quick look at these diagram. Oh, so many tryptamine families. The first wave of research into psychedelics. Not surprisingly, psychedelics whose effects fall so markedly outside what is normal for drugs have had a perpendicular story with many ups and downs. This is true regarding both their use and research that have been performed to elucidate how their effects, how, their, how they exert their effects. Although shamans for millennia have used plants and mushrooms with psychedelic effects, such substances entered the modern world in a totally unexpected and abrupt way. The critical event was the synthesis of LSD, lesergic acid dimethyl, dimethyl, in 1938 by Albert Hoffman, a chemist in Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland using erga, a fungus living on, a barley, on barley as a starting material. Hoffman let the substance he had, had synthesized sit on the shelf until 1943. When he, got a, when he got a hunch that he had solved the issue revisit it, he tasted it, and on his bicycle ride home, he had remarkable visions that could only be attributed to the substance he had ingested. 
He would later say that he did not he did not go looking for the substance, it came to him. The psychedelic properties of LSD were a significant discovery, and to this day no substance with a, compar with a comparable potency on a per milligram basis has been found. Soon after this, the potential uses of LSD in, psycho in, psychiatric, in psychiatric began to be explored, and it was suggested that it could be used in research as a psychotopaminerotech drug. I'm not familiar with what that is. Psychotomy. Metric, psycho, psychotomy metric drug. In other words, as a drug that mimics the state of psychosis. Oh, cool. Though this view might have been given LSD a negative connotation, it resulted in much psychopharmacological research in the 1950s and the 1960s, when hundreds of papers and dozens of books were published on the potential therapeutic uses of psychedelics. Sandoz, where LSD had been synthesized, gave it away to scientists around the world in hope, in the hope that they would find meaningful applications for it, which gave, huh, isn't that beautiful? He gave it away, he didn't patent it. He wanted everyone to know about it. He thought it was, he thought it was the love drug answer. He knew it was a shamanic substance and he knew he had to give it away. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing, which gave this research a special boost. Most of today's promising therapeutic application in psychedelics were discovered during this first wave of research. An excellent detailed review of the history of psychedelics based on the interviews with many of those involved can be found in Michael Pollan's How to Change, How to Change Your Mind. LSD soon attracted interest outside the world of psychiatric, out of psychiatry as a conscious altering substance and a tool to explore the nature of the mind. Aldous Huxley, the British author of Brave New World fame, used mescaline and later LSD as a basis for his seminal book, The Doors of Perception, which discusses some of their some of their philosophical implications. As the LSD therapy began to be used by Hollywood celebrities, it was only a matter of time before LSD elapsed, escaped the laboratory, and became more, more widely available. Hey, Valentina, what are you playing with? What? What you up to? I heard you chewing on something down there. Just relax. No, no shake a paw, shake a paw. But there's no tree. She just learned shake a paw, so now shake a paw is the answer to everything. Babe, sit down, sit. Lie down, lie down. Hey, no, lie down, lie down. Good girl. You just stay, stay. Wait, good girl. Okay, good, right? Soon after, the potential uses, oh wait, we read that. Uh, how to change your mind, LSD, oh, there she goes, pretty good world. See, the doors of perception and discuss some of the philosophical implications. As LSD therapy began to be used by Hollywood celebrities, it was only a matter of time before LSD escaped the laboratory and became more widely available. In the 1960s, Harvard professor Timothy Leary and his team quite indiscriminately began to advocate the use of LSD for a number of reasons which were dismissed from their positions. Around the same time, LSD entered popular culture through the hippie movement and rock musicians as Leary continued to spread his message of turn on, tune in, and drop out. This did not sit well with the mainstream American society. A large number of people also ended up in emergency rooms because they were using LSD in settings where they were unprepared for some of the dramatic side effects. In the context of the highly conflict-ridden social environment of the United States at the time, the press started to issue one-sided reports about the risk associated with the use of LSD, some of which were, part, were patent, patently false, hmm. such as the claim that LSD caused, caused ge genetic risks. Backed by this hysteria, the U.S. Congress passed a law in 1970, the Controlled Substance Acts, banning the manufacture, sale, and use of LSD and other psychedelics, a law that is still in effect today. You gotta love that fucking shithole country. <laughs> Psychedelics were classified as a substance that had no potential. Just the sickest minds. The sickest, most, <laughs> like, it's just the patriarchy down there. Falling through and just a bunch of dudes and then they just, the way they discuss it's so, it's so, well, linear, like he says, it's so directional. They think in squares, they think in squares and rectangles. Just boxes, little angry boxes. And they just keep thinking it'll work. It's hilarious and heartbreaking. 
The ban on psychedelics as substances was primarily politically motivated, as psychedelics are not addictive, and several studies have shown that their toxicity is low. President Nixon called Timothy Leary the most dangerous man in America. He's the most dangerous man in America. Nixon, you were the most dangerous man in America. <laughs> the John Eltman was later quoted as having saying the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and the black people. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? We knew we could make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. Yeah, yeah they did. Yeah. America. The land of the slave. All of you, even your elite, you don't even see it. Enslaved to yourselves. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evenings on the evening news. Did we know that they were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Though not specifically mentioned in the preceding quote, LSD and other psychedelics would be vilified during these decades for the same reasons by Elkman. Yet to this day, death due to direct toxicity of LSD is unknown, and there are not many drugs you could say this about. And in an appropriate setting, there are very few complications associated with psychedelics. A consequence of the brain was, however, that a large part of the public came to associate psychedelics with drugs, such as cocaine or heroin or other opiates, which are highly addictive and sometimes fatal. Another consequence was of the ban was the research about psychedelics came to a sudden halt. Not only did funding for the National Institute of Health cease, but research about psychedelics also was, with few ex exceptions, forbidden. How can people like willfully be like, no, we will not learn about something? Like, learn about everything. Science should be absorbing and learning about everything. It doesn't matter if it's legal or illegal. It should be provided to the scientists in, in legal capacities so that we as a species can gain knowledge. Something that might look like poison after 50 years of research might become a cure-all. Research everything. It's insane not to. Even if you ban something to the fucking public, why would you stop learning about it willfully? Men are so sick. And also, the eighth quantum wave. And now we're not, so, you know. It could only go this way. It could have only gone this way. It's, it's just part of it. It's just part of what balancing looks like. You gotta fall. You gotta know you're off balance before you can worry about being balanced. <laughs> Another consequence, of, right, I read that. The sudden, the sudden and dramatic freeze on the study of psychedelic substances, and in particular LSD, in effect blocked their potential position, their potential positive therapeutic applications. For maybe two decades, this substance has been overlooked as a promising tool in pharmacology, and then, and then it was so shunned that it seemed that it seemed it had never existed. Meanwhile, the use of LSD among the public continued, and it is estimated that some 30 million people in the United States have used this or other psychedelics at least once. I personally have explored right, maybe I think it was three times with psilocybin, which is mushroom, also non-toxic, and I've explored salvia, uh, which I mentioned in, in the last chapter, um, three times, four times, three or four times, all very shamanic experiences, and, and definitely did not want to rush back into them. I needed years to digest the experiences in between. I'm still working on understanding some of what I experienced. But between those two and marijuana, those are the only drugs I've ever done. Um, the emergence of an interest in shamanism in the 1980s, however, led some to explore using mushrooms with psilocybin, ayahuasca with DMT, and the iboga root with ibogaine. For this psychedelic effect, shamanisms gave these substances a new context. Ibogaine began to be explored as a substance that could cure addictions, while ayahuasca was sought for both the spiritual experience of gain and its potential to lead to heal post-traumatic stress disorder and a number of diseases typical of the modern world. As a result, these developments, scientific studies of psych psychedelics, including LSD, have increased since the 1990s. 
with a new way of research into the effects of psychedelics began. The second wave of research into psychedelics. After two decades of an almost total freeze on research about psychedelics, the situation started to thaw somewhat. Rick Straussman, the University of Mexico, gained permission to study the effects of DMT among a group of volunteers who were given different, both, different doses of it. He summarized his findings in his book, 2000 book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and the more recent film with the same name. The volunteers were given DMT intravenously with Strassman's recording this objective, as well as some objective physiological effects of different doses of the substance. Remarkably, among many of the phenomena noted in Strassman's study, about half of the volunteers reported encounters with entities that seemed to have an existence independent of themselves. Shamans are familiar with such entities and believe they exist independent of the minds of those who encounter them. It also has been my experience. In their view, such entities are not just products of an individual subconscious. If we take account of such beings at face value, which I do, we have to recognize experiences that do not readily fit into established scientific view that the mind is created by the brain. In contrast to this neurology, this neurological view, the existence of these entities suggests that windows of the mind, which are under normal circumstances kept closed, can be opened by psychedelics through which an anomalies, anomalous things may occur. We have in this book already seen that on a cosmic level, certain quantum states provide such windows. And we will in the next chapter look at how the effects of psychedelics are related to some of these states. And once again, I just want to stress um, if you're a really open neuroatypical crowd and you do already experience certain level of hallucinations, whether they're auditory, physical, sensorial, inside or outside of you, like that's the same thing as a psychedelic. And that's why this book is so helpful. Uh, if you're not just interested in learning about psychedelics. Strassman's study also attracted attention because DMT exists and degenerously and dege oh, <laughs> exists and degenerously naturally within the human body. Based on this, Strassman's hypnotized or hypothesized that DMT may, may be produced by the pineal gland and that bursts of this substance from the pineal may bind to the receptors in the brain that are responsible for the psychedelic effects. He, opposed, so he proposed that such a common underlying mechanism could exist not only for the altered states of consciousness induced by psychedelics and meditation, but also for near-death and alien abduction experiences. As new considerations have come from regarding this hypothesis, I will return to it in chapter 13. Since the turn of the 21st century, the second wave of research into psychedelics has broadened significantly, and a large number of researchers have become involved in studying the complex interactions of psychedelics with receptors. Various research groups have also been working to demonstrate that the therapeutic applications of psychedelics, notably the research groups of Charles Bro at New York University, Roland Scripps at John Hopkins in Baltimore, David Nutt and Robin Car Car Carhart Harris at Imperial College in London, and in several other universities as well. Studies by these groups, as well as we will see shortly, have indicated that psychedelics can be helpful in alleviating the fear of death in the terminally ill, as well as helping those who suffer from addictions and depressions. This work is remarkable as it has paved the way for potentially more widespread therapeutic use of these substances in the future. The pharmacology of psychedelics. The question scientists in this field is faced with is how to explain the spiritual psychological effects of psychedelics with their molecular structures as shown in figure 11.1 on page 212, which you saw. Why do these particular structures have such a special and far-reaching effects? Modern science has primarily approached this problem from the pharmacological and neurological state stance, which is forced, especially on these interactions psychedelics have with various receptors in the brain. A receptor is a protein that a naturally occurring, a naturally occurring biomolecule, a ligand in the body, such as serotonin, may non-convalent bind to. The binding of a, of a ligand to the receptor changes the conformation of three-dimensional structures of the receptor and often produces a signal that in indicates a cascade of biochemical pathways as a result of physiological effect. He's going to show us how the brain is a quantized computer working in those four directions, those 90 degree shifts. Light shadow. I just got a whole new respect for the human mind. Quantum computers, very cool. 
There are, however, some substances that take up from the environment called agonists that also react with the receptors and produce effects that may or may not be the same as those as the endogenous, endogen, endogenous substance. Psychedelics seem to be such Psychedelics seem to be such agonists for some of the serotonin receptors, meaning that they fit into them like a hand in a glove or a key in a lock. Both agonists and anti antagonists can bind to a receptor, but while anti agonists produce an effect, the antagonists block it. The starting point of the research into the relationship between psychedelics and the receptors was strikingly was was the striking similarity between the structures of the former of the former to serotonin, a transmitter that is also a tryptamine. Because of the structural similarities of LSD to serotonin, it was soon suspected that the mechanism of action LSD was related to the biochemical and pharmacological properties of serotonin, and a large body of work had consequently been performed to study the psychedelics in to study how psychedelics interact with the different receptors of the neurotransmitters. As a result of these receptors studies that stand out is the effect of the classic psychedelics are proportional to their affinity for the serotonin receptor called 5-H22A. The better the key fits into the lock, the stronger the unlock psychedelic effect will be. Psychedelics are thus believed to initiate their effects by reaching, by reacting with the receptor in the brain, cortex, where the presence of these receptors is especially dense or elsewhere. It should be noted that these receptors are widespread spread throughout the entire human body. Along the same line, suggesting a role of the binding of the psychedelics to the serotonin 5-H22A receptors, Swiss researcher Franz Wollenleiter demonstrated that if the binding of the tryptamine psychedelics to these receptors is first blocked by an antagonist called ketoserotin, most of the psychedelic effect in humans do not manifest. They, the lock has been blocked and cannot be opened by a real key. The classic psychedelics have also been shown to create cross tolerance to each other, indicating that they produce their effects through a common mechanism. Taken together, these observations provide a very strong case that the binding to the 5H2A2 receptor is a key pharmacological event that explains why molecules with certain structures have psychedelic effects. This also means that the different psychedelic agents act through essentially the same pharmacological mechanisms, and it is for this reason I will treat them as a group in, one, in this book. The binding of the tryptamines to a 5-H22A receptor is, however, only a necessary but not sufficient condition for unlocking the effects of psychedelics. And it is clear also that other receptors, and not necessarily only serotonin receptors, are involved. LSD especially has something has sometimes been referred to as the promiscuous molecule as it binds to a whole range of receptors. 13 serotonin receptors, including the 5-H22A receptor known to play a role for the effects of psychedelics, belong to the family of transmembrane proteins called G-protein coupled receptors because they give a small signal to G proteins to indicate a chain of bio biomechanical pathways. This is a very large family of receptors including some 800 different types with a wide variety of effects in the human body. So why does just the 5-H22A receptor possibly with the help of a few others produce the, remarkably effects, the remarkable effects of psychedelics? To solve this problem, researchers in the field have assumed that there is a difference in the bio, biomechanical pathways that psychedelics trigger as they bind to the receptors, but so far the study of these pathways has provided an unclear answer. How do we go from such relatively simple molecule interactions with a receptor to change in perception to order encounters with entities? What, in other words, is the connection between the affinities of the psychedelics with certain serotonin receptors to their phenomenology? We may also even ask if such connections exist given that the step seems quite long between a molecule and its varied psychedelic effects. Part of the difficulty of taking such a step lies in the fact that the experiences people have with psychedelics are unique to each person and not necessarily easily expressed into words. Moreover, they will vary from time to time and be strongly, and be strongly dose dependent. With these caveats, and certainly without any claim to being comprehensive, I provide in figure 11.2, a list of experiences that have commonly been associated with the shift to psychedelic states of consciousness. I will in the next chapter. In the next chapter, I will explain how these experiences, which exhibit an enormous variation, have been generated. However, for now, it may be noted that not all psychedelic experiences are pleasant, although they are sometimes 
generate feelings of euphoria. At other times, they are given rise to an almost unbearable fear, much like how a therapeutic worth not in every insight we gain is about things we consider positive. The nature of psychedelic experience is also dose dependent, so that might so that a high dose may give a full mind altering effect, while a low dose may primarily generate visual imagery. In the phenomenology of psychedelics, it is also important to include their ability to engender mystical experiences. An early study to explore the effects of psychedelics, in which, in this regard, was the so-called Good Friday experiment conducted by Walter Planck in the Marsh Chapel in Boston, 1962, where a group of theology students were given either psilocybin or placebo. Those who received psilocybin had experiences that, according to the mystical scale, were indistinguishable from those described over the centuries by mystics. The mysticism scale was based on the following different factors. Unity, transcendence of time and space, deeply felt positive mood, sense of sacredness, objectivity and reality, paradoxicality, paradox, paradoxicality, alleged infallibility, ineffallibility, transiency, and persisting positive changes in attitude and or behavior, which may be looked on as part of the phenomenological, as a phenomenological of the psychedelic. Rick Doblin followed up this study by interviewing the participants in 1989, 27 years later. All the participants who had been given psilocybin still felt the experience had significantly altered their lives in a positive way. Moreover, in a more recent 2011 ex extension of the experiment with new participants, Griffiths and co-workers found that more than 70% of the volunteers had complete mystical experiences with psilocybin giving persisting positive effects on attitudes, mood, and behavior. I can say the same for myself. Why would this be? We may rightly ask, and we will return to this particular question in the next chapter. Recently demonstrated therapeutic applications of psychedelics. This latter study is an example of how in the second wave of research into psychedelics, researchers are digging up studies from the first wave that have been buried for decades so that, now, so that they can now reproduce them in accordance with the current standard protocols of scientific research, Notice, notably despite the fact that these substances are still illegal and officially considering considered as having no medical value, the resurgence in research is a very positive development that has led to the explanation of the potential therapeutic yet uses of psychedelics, such as against addiction and depression and other mental health conditions. Regulatory agencies such as the Food and Drug Administration faced with serious mental health problems that plague societies such as the opioid pandemic and rapid suicides have simply seen themselves forced to explore new methods to respond to those challenges. As it has turned out, psychedelics, and maybe especially psilocybin, are substances that have seemed to hold the greatest promise for alleviating such adverse conditions. As a result, the standing of psychedelics in the medical establishment and among people at large will slowly begin to change. When considering such therapeutic uses of psychedelics, it is important to point out the most, the most if not all current researchers agree that psychedelics should be regarded merely as pills and that they should be used in different contexts other than other drugs. The focus now is on psychedelics-assisted therapy, meaning a client takes a psychedelic substance while in a supportive setting provided by experienced therapists who help the client integrate experiences gained during the altered state. There is a consensus among therapists who work with psychedelics that set and setting and intention and personality of the person taking the psychedelics as well as the spiritual, physical, and psychological environment in which this is done play a crucial role for whether the experience is going to be healing or not. <coughs> you want to go to a bush party with your friends around a bonfire, just to get drunk and have a good time, you're going to have a bad night. You want to go find a quiet space with a couple gentle friends, breathe for a while, some good food, I mean like fruit and veggies and berries, and drop some mushrooms in the woods, you're, you're going to have a really positive day. <laughs> Most importantly, the volunteers were also able to transcend some of their fear of dying. They came to embrace the idea that death is never an ending, but part of a process, and that death does not end my personal experience. One of the patients in the study said, I now have the distinct sense that there is so much more and so many different states of being. I have a sense that death is not the end, but a way of moving into different sphere. Around 80% of the cancer patients who participated showed 
statistically significant reductions in anxiety. And this effect persisted for at least six months. The patients with the best results were the ones who had the most complete mystical experiences. Psychedelics have also proven to be beneficial in the treatment of addictions. <coughs> the possibility of treating alcoholism with LSD was explored earlier in the 1950s and 1960s in a number of studies, and the results of some of them were recently compiled in a meta-analysis which showed that a single dose of LSD had a significant beneficial effect on 536 individuals who participated in this study at the current time. Michael Bogenschultz at the University of New Mexico is leading a large-scale study of 180 subjects which has not yet been completed. However, in the preliminary study with 10 subjects, abstinence did not increase significantly in the first four weeks of treatment when participants had not yet received psilocybin. <coughs> but increased significantly following psilocybin administration. Gains were largely uh, maintained to follow up to 36 weeks. <coughs> Among addictions, smoking is generally considered an especially difficult one to break. In a preliminary study with 15 participants, 80% abstained from tobacco for six months after administering psilocybin six months later this percentage should drop to 67. Despite the decrease over time, this is still a very good result compared to other programs designed to support the satiation of smoking. Those who reported that they had the most complete mystical experiences again obtained the best results. The potential power of psychedelics against addiction to opioids such as heroin has also been studied and to other studies and to another study on cocaine in, is underway. Superficially, it may seem odd that an illegal psychedelic substance may help with a wide variety of addictions. <clears throat> but it is not so strange if you assume that psychedelics generally hold the potential to help an individual break patterns that have been established by the ego and that they do not interact with the pleasure centers of their brain. Thus, based on these studies, psychedelics seem not only to be non-addictive, but also anti-addictive. And it is this attributed, and it is this attribute that potentially makes them useful against any type of addiction. Several studies have also been done to explore if psychedelics can alleviate symptoms of depression or even cure it. Given the hundreds of millions of people afflicted by depression on a global scale, this is obviously something that could have immense consequences for mental health, including for reducing suicide. Charles Grobe's initial study for using psilocybin against depression and the terminally ill has been followed <clears throat> by several others of depression several others by several others of depression by other causes. All have given positive results for the treatment of depression, even in cases of so-called treatment-resistant depression. In a recent study, the London group found that based on a quick inventory of depression symptoms, all 19 patients with severe or very severe depression showed a significant reduction in symptoms one week after the psilocybin-assisted treatment. And in the majority of cases, this was sustained after three to five weeks. Although the average level of symptoms increased six months after the psilocybin treatment, this still remained on a very, on average, at a 50% lower level than before the treatment, which is a remarkably positive result. <clears throat> An interesting ad additional finding of the study was that the decrease in depression symptoms was significantly correlated with what the author called insightfulness. A factor based on composite of unity, spiritual experiences, and blissful state. From this, we may again conclude that the mystical experience is critical for healing with psychedelics. Ayahuasca has, always, has also been found to have beneficial effects with treating people with reoccurring depression. A recent 2019 study has, however, shown that fast-acting psychedelics, such as pure DMT or, methyl, or methyloxy DMT, may be even more effective for this person, for this purpose. To these therapeutic findings should also be added that there are now studies that indicate that people in the general population using LSD have fewer mental problems than others, and that psychological drugs may reduce domestic violence as well as psychological distress and suicidal thinking. Even if such epidemiological, epidemiological, epidemiological studies, that's a hard word, even in such epidemiological, even in such epidemiological studies must be taken with a grain of salt, 
given the many possible uh, confounding factors. They indicate that psychedelics may generally have beneficial health factors. Taken together, all these studies consistently point in the same promising direction, sometimes to a remarkable and surprising degree, regarding the use of psychedelics. For these reasons, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has now approved psilocybin to be used in a phase three clinical trial involving human, involving hundreds of studies, hundreds of subjects. As a potential treatment of depression and a similar process uh, is underway in Europe. What legal, st what legal statutes psilocybin psychedelics may come to have in the future is anybody's guess. But at the current time, accessibility to them seems to be increasing, if not for the use of healthy people, then at least for the treatment of various adverse conditions. So there you go, man. If you're out there and you are massively depressed and you're just like, I've tried everything. I can't, I can't, I can't. Maybe, maybe reach out. I know here in British Columbia, you can legally, uh, you can legally purchase um, uh, psilocybin online through like the government site. Like it's a thing. You can, you can, you can find therapy for yourself if that's what's right for you. Um, consider it. If you're actually viciously depressed and suicidal all the time, and the typical route for helping with depression is not working for you, see this side <clears throat> This quote from a review article about psychedelics by David Nicholas of the University of North, North, North Carolina, 2016, well described the healing properties of psychedelics. High doses have a greater propensity to transport the user to an alternate reality where they lose contact with their everyday environment. These occasions are often described as peak experiences, transcendent or mystical, and are profoundly altered states of consciousness. Users may feel that they have transcended time and space or encountered their own concept of God, or they may feel that they have encountered otherworldly beings, feelings of being at one with the universe, reliving past memories, and so forth. With respect to medical value, this state of consciousness is most closely associated most closely associated with the dramatic therapeutic improvements. Although this phenomenon is more likely to occur after high doses of psychedelics, it can occur at nearly any dose if they set the settings, if the set and settings have been optimized to promote such altered states of consciousness. These experiences are often characterized among the most meaningful of the subject's life and can lead to persisting positive effects on attitudes, moods, and behavior. As summarized above, there is thus now substantial scientific evidence that psychedelics indeed may be healing. This is not to suggest, however, that any use of psychedelics is healing. In addition to this potential legal consequence, which may vary among countries, there are at least two risk factors that may be associated with their use and need to be taken seriously. First, the substances may be contaminated, either intentionally or not, by other substances with, to with toxic effects. That's kind of my thing. Like, if it doesn't come from the ground and I can't eat it or dry it and smoke it, I kind of leave it alone. Um, I am, I'm afraid of that kind of stuff, of being poisoned. I don't, I'm worried about that with drugs. Like, I would only ever get psilocybin um, from, like, you know, a health through a doctor. It's available. Prescriptions of ayahuasca, for example, may contain, oh, preparations of ayahuasca, for example, may contain plants such as Bruga Maceria salvisis, which at high doses can cause dark delusions. Second, if someone with experience does not guide the use of psychedelics, it can have detrimental psychological effects. The use of psychedelic requires a basic psychological and spiritual stability on the part of the user who otherwise may be overwhelmed by the phenomena he or she cannot handle. Certainly anyone who has a predisposition to a family history of mental illness would be ill-advised to use them in any setting. Oh. Moreover, so-called recreational use, for instance, combined with driving, can put not only your life, but other lives of others at risk. Really? You guys don't do ayahuasca and drive? I'm, I'm joking. Duh. Um, and yeah, I don't think people uh, with, with pre-existing mental illness or neuro-atypical, the neuro-atypical, like you have to... Gotta be smart about things. It's not it's not a sit at home, I'm having a really bad day, take it and hope for the best kind of thing. These are shamanic substances. 
these entities that you can visit and experience in these other worlds, they on some level are absolutely real. <laughs> so you kind of want to show up there for your, your best self, most balanced self forward instead of some chaotic creature come crashing into another dimensionality. You know, just feed your ego and self pure darkness and fear. And you don't want that. Nobody needs that. Overall researchers seem to agree that the psychedelic assistant therapy is most effective for conditions in which, people have, in which people have become stuck in a particular rut or are unable to get out of it while in their ordinary frames of consciousness. These includes not only addiction and depression, but also potentially abusive complexes and eating disorders, conditions in which the, di the dictatorship of the ego has forced the individual to maintain its continuity by cementing de detrimental habits. We may not yet have seen the full range of psychedelic assisted therapy, but also for generally healthy people, they probably do not have the power of helping to break habits, any habits to the extent that this is part of the intention of the individual taking them. Why this is so hopeful, why this is so hopefully becomes clear in the next chapter. In this chapter, we have explored where established science stands concerning the biochemical and pharmacological mechanisms of psychedelics and at the very promising recent studies into psychedelic assisted therapy. Yet this is only barely takes us closer to understanding how they work and why they are healing. Many neuroscientists today also recognize how little is currently understood from their own perspective about how psychedelics works. And I would argue that it is simply not possible to provide a full understanding of how psychedelics works within the reductionist paradigm currently dominating the life sciences. It seems that understanding how psychedelics works instead mandates the development of a novel, a scientific model for how the brain, mind, and spirit are related. To do chapter 12 tomorrow. Thank you for listening, everyone. Just follow me along. My neural atypical crowd hang in there. This is um, sharing mainly but for you guys. Because these tools are helping me, so maybe they'll help someone else. Oh, God, I'm a little bad. I'm so sorry. It was legs yesterday. In the gym, I can't move. Oh, fucking hit thrusters.